Greetings and welcome. Today we're turning to a topic which is really crucial for our concern for the, the, the tension between democracy and the politics of hate. And that's the topic of the psychology of supporters of the far right. So the question that we're asking is um, a crucially important question. It's, it's important in the United States, but it's important in almost every country in Europe. It's important in India. It's, it's important in Latin America. It's this question. Why do millions of ordinary people give their support to right-wing extremist parties with overtly racist and xenophobic values? Why are similar numbers of ordinary citizens willing to support leaders and movements which are explicitly or implicitly authoritarian and anti-democratic? And what features of individual psychology, personality, and worldview would support these political affinities? In a sense, we've been grappling with this question since uh, the very beginning of the course, and we're taking a um, kind of an empirical approach uh, in the readings that you've done for today. The approach we're taking comes from the field of uh, empirical personality psychology. And personality psychology is the field of research which attempts to understand some very basic features of human motivation and behavior. It gets its origin in the observation that people are not all the same in their behavioral responses to common life situations. There are important variations across individuals with respect to their behavioral dispositions. In general, we could say that the ingredients of action include beliefs, cognition, the way that we process our beliefs, emotion, values, stereotypes, and mental frameworks. But notice that those categories of uh, practical cognition apply to everyone, and therefore they don't really explain individual differences. Whereas personality psychology tries to dig in a little deeper and tries to um, account for the fact that different individuals, sometimes different individuals in different cultural settings, um, have different propensities or dispositions uh, to behavior. And unlike behaviorism, which was current in the first half of the 20th century, personality psychologists are perfectly happy to investigate mental characteristics, thoughts, and modes of reasoning. So there is a theory of political behavior which um, derives from that abstract list of categories which I mentioned in the previous slide. And it is most often expressed within the idea of rational choice theory. So a lot of political science, uh, especially in the United States, is founded in the idea of rational choice theory. This is the theory that people make rational decisions based on their beliefs and desires, and then they choose candidates, they choose policies, they choose the things which they invest their political energies and their actions in on the basis of what they expect will work best for advancing their goals and desires. And so to take a, just a, a very simple example, um, if we assume that the primary concern that people have is to have the highest material standard of living, living possible, and they believe that politicians, political leaders, um, through their policies can influence one standard of living, then the inference would be rationally the um, party or the, the candidate who can make the strongest case that he or she uh, will bring about the greatest likelihood of a high standard of living, that's the person who will gain political support. And remember the slogan which Bill Clinton had, which of course you don't remember, but I remember, it's the economy, stupid. That kind of depends on this theory of rational choice. But it turns out, and I think we've seen lots of evidence of this, political behavior is not wholly rational. It's not wholly means and rational, and people do not always act in their narrow self-interest. On the positive side, we can say that there are um, forms of collective action uh, there are people who come together to uh, advance um, things which they think are in the public interest or um, in the good of uh, the people or the, the groups of people with whom they identify. There are features of loyalty and commitment which affect political behavior. And there are also currents of ideology and passion 
which influence people's behavior. And as we've seen, some of those currents lead to support for right-wing authoritarian and racist causes. So the, the question then is whether there are personality traits which are influential in determining political behavior, or if not determining, then um, influencing political behavior. There's an interesting article I didn't ask you to read, which is called The Secret Lives of Liberals and Conservatives from 2008, which is asking the question, just a really very basic question, if we divide population between people who characteristically vote liberal and people who characteristically vote conservative, are there personality traits as defined by uh, standard measures, standard um, uh, research instruments, which distinguish between those two populations? And the authors of this article um, argue that there are, in fact, relatively stable individual differences in psychological needs, motives, and orientations towards the world between the two political groups, liberals and conservatives. And they provide evidence based on psychological experiments that demonstrate a strong association between a bundle of personality characteristics that liberals share and a different bundle shared by conservatives. They write in um, explaining their article, we address three main questions. First, does political orientation co-vary with basic psychological dimensions in the ways that have been suggested? Second, what specifically are the differences as well as similarities between liberals and conservatives in terms of personality profiles and dispositions and how strong are they? Third, if there are indeed meaningful psychological differences between liberals and conservatives, how are they manifested in daily behavior? And what they argue, um, and it's not a, an a priori argument, it is an empirical argument based on their study of studies, their study of personality studies of this question. They argue that the strongest psychological evidence supports the dimension of open-mindedness versus closed-mindedness. Now I emphasize again, these are not concepts which were drawn in order to make the distinction between liberals and conservatives. Rather, these are more general uh, concepts which have been developed in personality psychology as one, out of, or, uh, one dichotomy out of many for um, characterizing individual personality differences. Uh, two quotations here. Numerous studies have shown that liberals tend to score higher than conservatives on individual difference measures of openness, cognitive flexibility, and integrative complexity. And conservatives tend to possess stronger personal needs for order, structure, closure, and decisiveness in comparison with liberals. And furthermore, they make a really interesting claim uh, um, based on longitudinal studies. Longitudinal studies are studies that begin at one point in a person's life and then do reassessment at subsequent points in life. And longitudinal studies, which began studying children in nursery school and then continued to study them through adulthood, longitudinal studies suggest that these personality traits are present in nursery school children. That in other words, there is a difference in terms of open-mindedness versus closed-mindedness, even among children at the age of four. Uh, here is a table which they present in their article of um, personality characteristics, which empirically, observationally, sort across the liberal left-wing group and the conservative right-wing group. And it's kind of an interesting um, comparison. It's uh, in a more contemporary presentation, it might be a word cloud. But uh, liberal left-wing characteristics include slovenly, ambiguous, and different, open, tolerant, flexible, life-loving, -lo free, unpredictable, excited, sensation-seeking, complex, nuanced, open-minded, open to experience. These are, again, I note, characteristics that have been studied and identified by um, personality psychologists with who are not interested in this question, liberal versus conservative. And then the uh, traits associated with conservative um, individuals, definite, persistent, tenacious, tough, masculine, firm, rigid, intolerant, conventional, ordinary, careful, practical, methodical, withdrawn, reserved, stern, cold, mechanical, 
self-controlled, moralistic, closed-minded, conscientious. It's very interesting reading through these characteristics because I personally, I see some of myself in both lists and that may be true for you as well. Uh, th this is uh, the last little bit I'd like to take out of this article. In the three studies employing very different methods of observation, we have obtained consistent converging evidence that personality differences between liberals and conservatives are indeed robust, rep replicable, and behaviorally significant. This is a very significant um, finding for empirical social psychology or personality psychology. So now let's turn, the, the previous discussion really didn't yet have to do with populism, but now let's turn more specifically to understanding populist extremists. And we've, we've already been exposed to two theories from personality psychology, which appear to be relevant to understanding the personality profile of supporters of extreme right populist movements. And these two theories are social dominance orientation and right-wing authoritarianism disposition. And these are also two distinct research traditions, communities within personality so, uh, psychology, within social psychology, which have developed over multiple decades. Um, the right-wing authoritarianism uh, tradition began right after World War II and um, developed around the question of, is there an authoritarian personality? And the work has been very interesting and has continued to develop for a period of now 70 years. These researchers have developed what personality psychologists live for, and that is testing instruments to measure various attributes in ordinary subjects. In other words, take a questionnaire and um, then the, um, the questionnaire is evaluated for validity and interpersonal val validity. Then a bunch of individuals, often college students because they're available research subjects, are sorted by the, the cluster of uh, characteristics which they um, share with some others and uh, do not share with others. So let's talk about the right-wing authoritarianism scale. Um, the primary developer of current versions of right-wing authoritarianism measurements is Bob Altemeyer, who is a research um, academic psychologist and one of the founders of right-wing authoritarianism theory. Uh, he developed an instrument for measuring an individual's propensity for authoritarian thoughts and actions. This is um, a really important instrument, I think. This is the RWA scale, and its methods... Uh, the, the, this method has received widespread adoption and use. Uh, quoting uh, from the article that you read, the right-wing authoritarianism scale measures the degree to which people defer to established authorities, show aggression toward outgroups when authorities sanction that aggression, and support traditional values endorsed by authorities. Just think about that definition um, from the lens of the empirical phenomena that we've been talking about, which you've learned from Moody, for example, about right-wing politics and populism. The uh, deferring to established authorities, aggression towards outgroups when sanctioned by authorities, and supporting traditional values when endorsed by authorities. This maybe sheds some light on how important the relationship is between individual followers' behavior and the messages and communications which are issued by leaders. Here's a quote that um, I think is a, an important one from the article that you read. Right-wing authoritarianism, as currently measured, is an individual difference variable that assesses attitudes concerning three co-varying facets derived from Adorno's original work. He had nine dimensions, and um, the, the three which are measured here are authoritarian submission, authoritarian aggression, and conventionalism. In other words, RWA measures the degree to which people defer to established authorities, show aggression towards outgroups when authorities sanction that aggression, and support traditional values, especially as endorsed by authorities. That's the, um, the, the definition of the RWA scale.
the RWA scale, now again, a quote from the article that you read, is an individual difference variable that assesses attitudes concerning three co-varying facets, authoritarian submission, authoritarian aggression, and conventionalism. We can ask, that, and probably the, the important thing to emphasize here is that when this questionnaire is administered to random groups of individuals, there is a sorting of indi individuals into groups, into individuals who score high on the RWA scale and those who score low. In other words, these characteristics are not randomly distributed. So where do these personality traits come from? That's an, an important question, which we'll return to in a couple of minutes. But are they innate individual differences, the way that some people are maybe more outgoing than others as a result of something innate that they inherited from their parents? Or are these differences the consequence of early childhood experiences or early social experiences? Uh, do children who grew up on kibbutz in Israel, do they have different personalities with regard to RWA characteristics than children who grew up in, um, um, I don't know, a different environment in Norway, let's say. Th that would be an interesting empirical question. I don't know of a study which, um, uh, which illuminates that question. But we can also ask, do these traits persist over time and do they even get more distinct over time? Now let's turn to the other major theory, which seems to be important and relevant. This is called social dominance orientation. The social dominance orientation scale was introduced by Jim Sedanius, who was a social psychologist, an African-American social psychologist at the University of Michigan for much of his career in the 1990s, and is presented in the article that you read. Like RWA theory, this theory also has experimental instruments that have been tested and validated in multiple contexts. In other words, um, SDO theory is not a philosophical theory, it's not an a priori theory, it is instead an empirical instrument of personality research. And it identifies the attitudes that individuals share who believe in group superiority and a positive valuation of social inequalities. And it has been used to understand the persistence of racist attitudes and behavior in American society. I won't read this abstract, but it's, um, it gives a good description of what social dominance orientation theory uh, involves, um, basically one's degree of preference for inequality among social group groups. On the basis of social dominance theory, it is shown that men are more social dominance oriented than women, high SDO people seek hierarchy enhancing professional roles, and low SDO people seek hierarchy attenuating roles. C, SDO was related to beliefs in a large number of social and political ideologies that support group-based hierarchy, for example, meritocracy and racism, and to support for po policies that have implications for intergroup relations, for example, war, civil rights, and social programs. Uh, this is all from the article that you read from Sedanius and, and others. And the theory, again, I'm quoting now from that article, the theory postulates that, theory, that societies minimize group conflict by creating consensus on ideologies that promote the superiority of one group over another. Ideologies that promote or maintain group inequality are tools that legitimize discrimination. So in other words, um, the authors in Sedanius have made an effort to link the personality attributes to a broader theory of how various societies work and how social dominance is one of the tools which um, turn out to be uh, common in various kinds of social organization. We can ask the interesting question, are these assessment tools, is SDO um, in particular, are these tools and these traits of personality, um, are they comparable across cultural settings? And in fact, this is not an empirical observation exactly, but what we've now been reading about German, French, Dutch, American followers of right-wing extremism, these two theories seem to be descriptively relevant in describing the behavior of the followers of right-wing extremist parties in Europe and North America. 
A point which social psychologists generally make is that personality studies of difference are generally a matter of distribution rather than being categorical. So it's not the case that um, one group of people are, have a 100% rating on SDO and RWA, and another group of people have 100% at the other extreme, but instead that there is a distribution of traits across groups. So it's important in personality studies to recognize there is significant variance within groups and significant overlap across groups with respect to characteristics that distinguish them as groups. And so I, this curve is not taken from this literature, but it's just to kind of illustrate the point that I'm making here. Um, imagine these two bell curve distributions with respect to right-wing authoritarianism, where we might look at the left distribution as being um, oh, let's say young environmentalists and the right distribution being um, uh, older climate uh, deniers, climate change deniers. So we've defined two groups and then we've administered our uh, SDO uh, instrument and we find a distribution in both groups. The point I'm uh, wanting to draw your attention to is there is a degree of overlap so some in the uh, environmental activist group, uh, some who have uh, SDO ratings, which are higher than the SDO ratings, or the RWA, I guess I was imagining, uh, ratings of individuals in the other group. In other words, this is not a dichotomous um, uh, distribution. Instead, it's an overlapping set of distributions. However, as I said, this graph is not empirical. But what we might find is that the two distributions are a lot further apart. So that yes, there is overlap, but it's really only at the tails. In this instance, there are just eyeballing, it seems like about 25% of each distribution overlaps with the other. But if the, um, the peaks were further separated, you would find that uh, only a much smaller percentage of individuals overlap with individuals of the other group. So now let's come back to the developmental question. Why do different individuals develop in such a way as to manifest differences on these two scales, the dominance um, scale and the right-wing authoritarianism scale? Why do some individuals become intolerant and authoritarian adults, whereas other adults are tolerant and democratic? Are these two characteristics or these uh, bundles of personality characteristics linked? or are they independent from each other? What facts of social context, family relations, education, perhaps economic and social factors are most important to giving rise to a social psychology of social dominance and right-wing authoritarianism? This question was one of the, the driving questions for the earliest um, theories of um, authoritarian personality, and Adorno in particular, who was a refugee from Nazi um, Austria and um, Germany, uh, were there circumstances in the Weimar Republic which especially enhanced authoritarian personality? That was kind of a key question. A, a theory is offered in the readings that you've done. Uh, Saunders and, and Nagel um, offer a social cognitive theory. Uh, it's referred to as motivated social cognition, and they give a, an academic reference. But the claim is that people who adopt right-wing authoritarian attitudes to meet psychological needs such as reduction of fear, existential needs, uncertainty and loss, epistemic needs, as well as meeting related needs for structure and cognitive closure. So what they're basically saying is RWA attitudes are cultivated or enhanced or encouraged in individuals as coping tools for coping with fear, uncertainty, and um, other needs. Uh, this is summarized in these terms, analyzing political conservatism as motivated social cognition integrates theories of personality, epistemic and existential needs, and ideological rationalization. On this approach, uh, conditions of insecurity, fear, and threat are thought to encourage the personality psychology of intolerance and authoritarianism. I would say that these theories are useful for our purposes in the course, um, the rise of right-wing populism, uh, right-wing extremism. These theories are helpful. Um, I'm not taking them as um, 
you know, established with certainty, but they're helpful in terms of our ability to think through why is there so much widespread support for right-wing authoritarianism and uh, racist extremism. These theories are helpful because they address the fundamental puzzle. Why do ordinary people adopt the political values of racial superiority, disregard of the rights of minorities, and openness to authoritarian leaders? And one part of an answer might be suggested by the theory of, you know, kind of fear and loss uh, represented in the previous slide, because the precariousness of certain parts of the populations, Western Europe, North America, um, issues of uh, threat, fear, and uncertainty arising from terrorism, shifting demographic balance, consequences of globalization, all of these sources of uncertainty and fear may be all it takes to trigger this toxic and intolerant form of personality in an extensive portion of the population of these countries. This suggests, it's suggestive for us, I hope we'll have some conversation about this, that the theories of authoritarian personality at the individual level and the political entrepreneurship at the political level may go a long way to explaining the scope and depth of right-wing populism in liberal democracies today. But the discussion may also suggest a remedy, which is to reduce fear, to increase trust, and to reduce the forms of uncertainty which possibly trigger an inclination towards right-wing authoritarianism.